Hey, it's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. Today, I have uh, Adam Duke with me. He's a board member of the Cannabis Certification Council and a senior account executive with Leaf, Lo Leaf Logics. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Benjamin. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this show is sponsored by BuzzFeed, LinkedIn for Leaders Online, and Eight Saints Organic CBD made from organic Colorado hemp. So, Adam, thank you for your flexibility today. I really appreciate you coming on to the show, and I know it's going to be a good one. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed your past broadcasts and looking forward to those in the future, too. Great. I appreciate it. Well, if you could bring the viewers and listeners up to speed on how you got into the industry and really what you're working on now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm here in Detroit, Michigan, uh, born and raised here, uh, went to school here. I was fortunate enough to be able to travel the world um, during that time, uh, spent some time in Southeast Asia, in Borneo, um, seeing cannabis plants as early as 2007, growing along the shores of the Mekong in mm -hmm. Thailand, um, as well as I had an opportunity a few years ago to go to Africa and spend some time with the group that hunts and gathers full time. And they have stone pipes and they've been consuming cannabis for thousands of years in that same place. So I've always had a deep interest in the plant and in the healing properties of it. Um, but it wasn't really until uh, 2015 when one of my good friend's dads got sick. He was diagnosed with a glioblastoma brain tumor. Um, and for any of those who know about glioblastomas, it's pretty much a death sentence. And so um, the search began for things that would help Johnny uh, with his quality of life through the end of his life. Um, I had some friends who were working at a caregiver center at the time in the city of Detroit. And so I went to work for them doing some consulting and trying to find clean cannabis, something that you could give to somebody with an, uh, who's compromised with an immune or compromised situation or somebody who was sick. Um, and I was shocked to find out that the cannabis that was being sold was certainly not something that you would give to somebody who was sick because there was no standards for testing or any testing really available at that time. Hmm. Um, but what I was also fascinated to find is that Within six short months, we went from doing $500 a day out of a former abandoned gas station in the city of Detroit to almost $10,000 a day. And this was a result of getting to know the customers, getting to know the community around us, engaging, procuring products that people were asking for, um, developing real relationships with the customer. And it was at that time uh, in tw early 2016 that I really realized what a potential for help this industry has. Um, I went to work on a vertically integrated company here in Michigan, uh, spent a couple of years traveling the country, going to all sorts of different licensed markets, learning about um, the uh, successes and failures in those markets, learning the trends of the industry to try to not repeat all of those same failures um, and not try to reinvent the wheel here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. so, along that journey, I came across the Cannabis Certification Council which is a organization that promotes clean cannabis. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but as my vertically integrated company, um, as it was seeming like we weren't going to potentially get the investors and partnership problems, I ended up working in the ancillary services industry, which has given me an amazing um, access to see how the industry has developed and also to do training. Um, I helped launch the first 25 store retail stores here in Michigan um, for a point of sale company. And I now work with Leaf Logics as a, um, a senior account executive advising cultivators, processors, and retailers on how they set up a uh, compliant business. Mm -hmm. It's been really exciting. You know, that's a, it's a good journey really, you know, and it, and you started out, you know, and you've seen cannabis in, in places that people probably have never seen cannabis before and then seen it really the evolution here specifically over the past, you know, four years or so, how that's really grown here specifically to become a real business, you know, not not just and I, I mean, real business in terms of ancillary services, all the support that comes with that. You've really seen that mature over the past four to five years. Big time. I mean, I often put it as, you know, it's a billion dollar industry with no legs. It appeared almost overnight, um, and unlike other industries which have developed over time, um, this one didn't have the supporting services available. So it's amazing to have companies like Leaf Logics 
like Dutchie Shabazz yesterday, who uh, did a great job talking about the future of e-commerce, um, which we'll touch on a little bit. But as you know, this thing changes so much and the uh, customer experience goes from one that was only allowed to, to happen face to face in store to one that is now taking place um, or a large percent of them are taking place online. Um, it offers a totally different uh, chance for these brands and these retailers to sh to inform the public and inform their customers on the products that they have. Oh yeah, I mean, great opportunities online. Yeah, it was a good discussion, and I think that uh, you know the the leaf logics, you know, and the data that you receive can add into that, which we we will talk about. I want to know first though about your your um, sustainability symposiums that you're you're working on here with the council. I mean, I, I've got the emails, you know, we've talked about it before. It seems like you're doing amazing things going in that direction. I'd love for you to talk to the viewers and listeners about that. Yeah, thank you. The Cannabis Certification Council is a fantastic organization um, out of Denver, and we uh, use our platforms to promote clean cannabis. Um, we've got a What's in My Weed campaign, educating consumers so that they should know the right types of questions to be asking. Um, I just hosted a fantastic Happy, Happy Plants series uh, episode on Wednesday night where we're actually talking with uh, seasoned cultivators and retail shop owners about the types of questions and uh, things that consumers should be looking for when shopping in these stores because it's a, it's a really confusing experience if you've never done it before. So this uh, sustainability symposium itself is more directed toward industry folks and bringing together thought leaders and brands, technologies. Um, it's a partnership with the City of Denver Sustainability Working Group. So our, it, it typically had been taking place in October um, on site, but as a result of COVID and things moving online, we've been really excited to be able to uh, move this event to be completely digital. And so on October 4th to, through the 8th of 2021, we will have a series of fantastic speakers keynotes and uh, breakout sessions in order for people to learn about everything from on-site um, power generation to through LED technology and wastewater recycling, um, as well as, you know, all the way through packaging and um, either reusable hemp um, or biodegradable packaging options. So we're really excited about that. Um, throughout, we also have six symposium series events. Our next one is coming up on February 18th. So please keep a lookout for that um, coming at you from the Cannabis Certification Council. That's awesome. I mean, we can post the links down below so that you can get people, you know, interested in it. But I love the fact that you've moved things online su successfully and you're not just saying, well, we're going to wait and see what happens and then really plan for if there's an in-person event, let's say sometime this year. You're just saying, look, we're going to move forward utilizing technology and we're going to keep keep pushing forward on sustainability. We're going to get people involved and you know, it'll probably be some sort of a hybrid coming forward, but you're not waiting. You're saying this is important to us and we're just moving forward on it. Not only are we not waiting, but we've found that we're able to bring people together that we would never have had the opportunity to have them in the same room and on the same panel. And so what we've found is that we can really up the level of thought leadership and get people who are so busy um, with the things that they do able to get on, you know, 15 minutes half an hour of their time from their location and so we've really been able to to bring together some amazing folks and yeah, also it's way easier to do this than jump on a plane for two days you know for a half hour or something like that you know yep it, it really makes a big difference that's great i mean the the amount of people that i've been able to reach and talk to and, and form new collaborations and ideas i i never would have imagined that it would be this easy actually to just reach out to people have conversations and then collaborate on ideas. I mean, it's it truly is amazing, you know, what's come out of this in terms of the way that things used to be and the way that things will be going forward. It's a great point. And I, as a um, client advisor at Leaf Logics, I often speak to retailers about that very thing that, you know, this was an industry that it was illegal to do a curbside transaction in February of 2020. And in just a couple of days here, specifically in Michigan, um, it was illegal to then enter the store and it only legal to do a curbside transaction for cannabis. And so we've seen companies that were already moving or already focusing on the online customer experience and that quick 
curbside experience, they were the ones who, who really won and continue to win um, because they've set it up, they've set up their system and they're able to pivot and change and have put that effort into maintaining those online databases in order to give that uh, same experience that they would want their customers to have in store um, to, to get it right from the, their car. And who would have imagined, let's say a year and a half ago, that it would have advanced this much? I am t I have a, one of my best friends in the world, my former business partner. We've been friends since kindergarten. Uh, he had his first recreational as a 21 and older person buying experience on Wednesday, and he, and he couldn't believe it. You know, he went on to the website. He was able to peruse, see all these different things. He then cross-referenced those on Leafly or Weed Maps to learn more about it, then going back to that website. He said that he placed his order for a few hours in, into the future that, that afternoon, drove up to a park, go, drove up to the parking lot, texted the phone number and his name and the spot number. And within just a couple of minutes, somebody came out, asked him for his name, told him the amount, said he'd be back with his change. And he was absolutely delighted to drive away. He couldn't believe that that's where we're at. Um, I mean, it's just like ordering a pizza now. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So it, it has come such a long way, um, yeah. but there's so, still so far to go. Um, because just on that same note, you know, to cross-reference Leafly, to cross-reference Weed Maps, the customer has no idea that what Leafly tells you is not necessarily the same thing that is going on in that physical retail location that they may be visiting. So there's a big challenge also in just keeping customers informed and making sure that their experience is as good as it could be uh, because there's a real opportunity for them to think that they're getting something amazing and be extremely disappointed um, when they go ahead and try it. Which you, you don't want as any any sort of consumer facing brand whatsoever. So a lot Absolutely. of opportunity as you say. You know, I wanted to go back to what you were talking about data, you know, especially with Leaf Logic. So like the data that you study and really what you glean from that in terms of waste. Yeah. So um, at I had a energy consulting company with my dear friend when we, after college, that's what we did. We fixed energy, we fixed homes and businesses to be energy efficient. And so we really thought of things as an, as a system. It wasn't just your insulation or your windows or your doors. It's really how all of these things interact. And so what's so interesting as now in a client advisory role, um, trying to make sure that everybody's systems work properly. Um, and that they have the right system for success. And like you talked about, LeafLogic is a, a fantastic company. We, with our 1,500 plus retailers across the country, we did almost $3 billion in cannabis transactions in 2020. Wow. Um, almost a $1.5 billion increase from the year before. And as for those of us who have worked in the industry and who are sustainably minded, you know that a lot of those packages are probably not recycled. That's a huge right. mountain of trash that has been created as a result of, you know, this industry really blowing up. So continuing to be mindful of, you know, put what type of packaging people put their, their products in, um, the ability to do that online marketing, that digital marketing, that newsletter marketing, so that it doesn't all have to be put in, put on the fancy box. Um, or on a, on a lousy label, on a plastic squeeze top jar. Um, so definitely trying to um, steer people in a way that they're more mindful of the products in its full lifetime, uh, all the way from seed through sale. You know, what's interesting is when, you know, we've seen the, the, the pictures of like plastic floating in the ocean and you know, people walking on the beach. But that thing that you just said about the mountain of trash, it'd be interesting to study that data and say, you know, how big would that mountain actually be if we were able to take the data that you have, put it in one place with a graphic? I mean, can you estimate what, what that would actually be like? I mean, your average eighth is 35 to $45. Your pre-rolls are 15. You know, you could do the math to $3 billion worth of those two items and each jar is so large. Um, it's quite a tall mountain. And so as a client advisor, I'm always mindful to tell brands, cultivators, processors, you know, 
keep in mind how your product is going to be perceived and eventually received by that customer. Would you rather have it given in a glass jar that came from a renewable source that tells a good story? Or would you rather sell it in a big turkey bag and allow that any dispensary anywhere to put it in a really lousy Mylar bag um, and have your name associated with just another piece of trash? Yeah, it's be interesting to see. I, I love the fact that you're kind of counseling, uh, you know, you're, you're advising people to think about that. And here's a question I want to address here uh, from Rich. How important is hemp-based packaging, which we've talked a lot about on here, or sugar cane? You know, what do you think about those? Do you have any thoughts? I think that any alternative to petroleum-based plastic is a step in the right direction. It helps tell the story, which is what the, you have to create an emotional appeal to what you're doing. So a piece of hemp plastic or a piece of sugarcane uh, packaging isn't going to do it on its own. It's the effort and the story that the brands tell on why they chose to put it in a piece of uh, in a package like that. For instance, we've got a great cultivator here in Michigan who's in the trout capital of Michigan who recycles all of their wastewater so that they're not pumping any wastewater into these tr streams and wastewater system around them. That's a story that's fantastic to put on a jar. That's something that's going to drive an emotional appeal for all of us who've gr grown up and live in this wonderful, clean place full of, of fresh water and beautiful forests. Um, it's not just enough to put it in a good package. You have to tell people why you're doing it in order for them to have an emotional appeal to come back and purchase it again. Yeah, I mean, otherwise they're not going to know. They're not going to know. They're going to have no idea. There's a campaign here in Colorado. It's a Coors beer about, you know, you can save the rivers. And it, it's interesting how they talk about saving water the way that they process. But it doesn't come across clear enough. I don't have that connection. And I think that there are that there is a lot of opportunity for brands to really drive that home. You know, the why behind why you're trying to do something. So when people understand that and it actually transfers, not just words on a billboard or words, you know, on the label that you can, when you can actually feel that, then you're going to get back to the, um, that connection and you're going to invest in that brand. Uh, and I, you've done a good job of, of, you know, poking and provoking uh, thought leaders to have this be top down, bottom up, everybody, all hands on deck. It can't just be, the sustainability director who comes in and says, hey, this is something that we should think about because it's going to help our bottom line. It, it, it truly has to be on the forefront of why decisions are being made. The, the cultivator who I spoke to is recycling the wastewater wasn't considering putting that on their packaging. They were doing it for other reasons. But those are the types of stories that customers want to hear about. They want to find companies that are actively doing a good job and not just scraping by on the bare minimum. Um, which, you know, when I was, had my energy consulting company and we used to fix homes and buildings, you know, people would often ask us, how much insulation should I put in my attic? And we'd say, well, code is this, but do you really want to just pursue code? Because anything less than code is illegal. So do you want to be shooting for code or do you want to be shooting for as good as you can be? And as good as, you know, it, it needs to be in order to work with the whole system. So yeah. I think that's the same thing in that that's the way that it needs to be thought about in cannabis is, is it good enough to just pass testing or should you actually be driving um, other companies to do a better job also? Yeah, that's a good point. I want to address something here uh, from, from Michael VR labeling. I think there's a lot of opportunity, uh, you know, whether, whether it's a QR code that pops onto your phone and then you've got an ad on there that you can change There's so much that can be done in that, that interactive labeling where you don't actually have to put all the information on or try to cram it onto the label. You can just have a QR code and then the brand comes to life and you can change that, use it as an incentive to drive people into the dispensary to get rebates, uh, you know, interviews with founders like pairings, all this stuff that we could be taking advantage of to really talk about what you're doing specifically in terms of sustainability. What are your thoughts on that in terms of the, the customers that you see um, and are they moving in that direction? I don't think that anybody would argue that things are moving less online and that people don't have enough time to consume content on their phones or other devices. So 
Um, actually, plug for Leaf Logics, one of the best things about that program is the ability to create unbelievable versatile labels, including QR codes, including VR codes. That way, somebody can dig in deeper to the product that they're buying. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that, you know, the brands who are producing these products are the ones who truly should be thinking about this and not necessarily putting that weight and that pressure on the retailer to apply that, that specific label. Um, the human cost of labor is more expensive at the retailer than it is at the processor because of 280E challenges uh, currently. So that's definitely something that brands should be aware of and should be utilizing is introducing people to the brand, giving them a tour of the facility, showing them all of those all of those passionate people who are working there and reasons why they're doing what they're doing. So I think that labeling, um, packaging, um, the organically grown standard that's coming out by the CCC later this year, that will help direct consumers to know that it's a baseline of good versus something that's totally synthetic. So in terms of VR, QR, um, virtual tours, pictures, I think that there's a lot to be gained from brands really being mindful of how is somebody going to keep this, store this, have it on their shelf, be curious about it, um, and hopefully reuse that package and not throw it away. So when you're talking about 280, you're saying that the dispensaries cannot deduct uh, certain business costs, but you're saying that other parts of the business can, and they so they should be the ones who are really driving this interactivity, not just relying like a POP to drive or a billboard to drive people into a dispensary because they're, they're, they pay more taxes uh, in a dispensary. That's correct. So 280E only allows you to uh, deduct the cost of goods sold of your products. And so the cost of labor is not a cost of goods sold at the retailer. But the person who is packaging and putting that into the jar at the processor or the cultivator, that is considered a deductible business expense. And so uh, love that, love that point. That's that's really good to emphasize. Well, I want to talk here about you know what you have going on uh, with the consumer here with uh, the, the the product uh, that you're creating, zero waste gardening kit. I mean, I want to have one. It sounds cool. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, to bring home all of these things that we talked about, there's so much trash, there's so much waste in the industry. I, I couldn't believe it when I read the stat that 3% of our nation's power was going to grow indoor cannabis. Um, that unfortunately means that everybody who's a consumer, anybody who's shopped at a store is pro cannabis or pro fracking in their buying decisions. So they may be anti fracking in their uh, opinion of themselves, but when making their buying decisions, they're supporting that. And so um, I've teamed up with uh, Ben from the Cannabis Certification Council to bring a easy MJ to market, which is a easy uh, countertop grow cannabis like a houseplant gardening kit. Everything in the kit has been sourced from biodegradable or recycled materials, or they can be reusable um, so that they're isn't any trash and that trying to introduce people to the idea of being able to grow their own plant at home. If you grow your own tomatoes, uh, you could definitely grow cannabis. And if you do grow tomatoes, it's likely that you don't buy them at the store during the season when you're able to grow them yourself and that you sup supplement your own growing with, um, with tomatoes that you can buy when you can't do it yourself. It also makes you a better buyer of tomatoes because you know what to look for what makes a good tomato versus a bad tomato. And so by bringing people uh, this um, right here, a homegrown uh, countertop pot plant, um, it's discreet, it doesn't smell, but it introduces people to the entire life cycle of the plant from seed all the way through harvest in as little as 60 days using uh, cannabis ruderalis, which is the auto flowering um, type of cannabis, which is not the um, type of cannabis that commercially commercial farms use. So this is one that's much easier to grow at home. It has a built-in life cycle so that it doesn't need to be photo period manipulated. You don't need special lights, special tents, special equipment. Um, this plant right here behind me um, lived its entire life in about 60 days, uh, all the way from seed, and it's about to be ready for harvest. Uh, that, that's super cool. So when you're talking about you become a better tomato shopper, 
And that's probably because what you look, you know, you know what you're going to use for pesticides or if you use, you know, hydroponics or what type of fertilizer. So you're saying really that you the same thing applies to here in some ways that you, you're learning through the act of growing with your kit. And that would make you a better consumer because you know everything that goes into that to make it a better plant. Absolutely. I mean, some of the people who you have brought on this have concurred that, you know, sun grown cannabis natural cannabis, um, something that hasn't been poked, prodded, dumped with salts or fertilizers, um, liquid fertilizers. All I'm bringing to people is the concept of if you grow plants at home, if you have plants in your house, you could also grow cannabis. You don't need to go to the hydroponic store down the street and ask that guy how to grow because he's going to sell you all the stuff in his store. The lights, the powdery mildew sprays, everything, right? Absolutely. And even just a simple search on the internet of how to grow cannabis will lead you to a for immediate fork in the road that depending on which branch you take, you're going to be a deep water culture salt grower, or you're going to be a cocoa grower, or potentially you could be a living soil grower. But the idea that there is no one way that is totally right, you can grow this plant a million different ways, but the results are all different. And that certainly the most sustainable and the is just growing them outside uh, when you grow the rest of your plants outside in your garden. And also just using a, you know, a simple L single LED or a CFL light bulb in your living room uh, goes a long way for those of us in the uh, northern climate that have a lot of darkness in the winter. Hmm. That, that's cool. I mean, is it available now? Are you bringing it to market? How, how would people know about it? It is. So pre-sales are available right now on easymjclub.com. Uh, so you can go ahead and pre-order. Um, hopefully we'll be shipping these out in the next couple of weeks. Um, but it's been a, a really exciting journey to try to source and difficult journey to try to source quality materials that are either made from recycled materials or that are biodegradable. So I think that there is an onus on all of us to be more considerate about all the things that we purchase and using them later on in furthering their life cycle so that it's not just a piece of trash. You know, the cool thing about this is that, you know, when I've talked to, to uh, about larger companies really need to be transparent with their information and explain the process of what they're doing so it isn't just greenwashing. That's really what your kit is, is you are showing people the process. And so in the process of you explaining to them through them doing it themselves, it makes your company way more, uh, I would say, valuable from a brand standpoint, because you're not just selling them something in a box. You're explaining why that is. And when they do, they learn. So I think that's I think that's awesome. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Part of the mission is to make a better consumer. So if people only use my kit one time, that is totally fine with me. If they purchase a refill kit, great. But next time they go to the store, they're going to know the difference between what they were able to grow at home and produce themselves. And they're going to go and ask, was this soil grown? Was this, was this grown with in hydro? They're going to be able to recognize a little bit of that difference, which is then going to hopefully raise the bar for all of the cultivators out there who just don't have the incentives now to make that change because the consumer is totally happy. And, you know, citing my best friend a couple of days ago, couldn't believe it. Couldn't have been any happier to have been buying flour online, picked it up, went home. But there's no way to really tell what that is. That's right. That's right. Awesome. Well, between the sustainability symposiums you have coming up, all the things you're learning from the data, your kit, sounds like it's going to be a great year for you. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm really excited. I, I hope that 2021 is a remarkably successful year for, for everyone, especially those who are working in sustainability. I think it will be. So how can people learn more about the symposium? Is there a, a website that they can go to? Yeah. So to learn more about our symposiums, you can go to CannabisSustainability.org or on LinkedIn, you can find the Cannabis Certification Council. Uh, learn more about our symposiums, our Happy Plant series, as well as the organically grown cannabis standard that's coming to market later this year. And to talk to you more, what's the best way? Through LinkedIn? Do you have an email you send people to? LinkedIn is a, is a great way to get a hold of me. So you can easily find me there, Adam Duke. Um, you can also find me at easymjclub at gmail.com if you have questions about the kit. 
Um, and if for all the licensed producers out there, I'd be glad to show you LeafLogix and show you how um, compliance seed to sale software um, will help you guys reduce the cost of labor on site to help increase the likelihood of a good customer experience. Great. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on to the show and, and looking forward to, uh, to learning more and, and uh, attending one of your symposiums. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be glad to have you. Um, and when the time is right, we'll, I'll send out a coupon code for all of your viewers um, and continue the, the great work, bringing great people to, uh, to your show. Great. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, everybody.